Well, good evening to everyone, and welcome to this very special lecture for Morden members and their friends. I'm delighted to introduce the Master of Morden, Sir Christopher Greenwood, who will be speaking about the Nuremberg Trials 75 years on. Sir Christopher was admitted as Master of our College in October this year, the first former undergraduate of the College to be elected Master for 150 years. As many alumni will, of course, know, before becoming Master of Magdalen, Sir Christopher was a Fellow of the College, served as Tutor, Dean and Director of Studies uh, in Law, before his election as Professor of International Law at the London School of Economics. As a barrister and a QC, he also regularly appeared as counsel before many tribunals, including the European Court of Human Rights and the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. And in 2009, he was appointed a judge at the RCJ at, and to, at the ICJ, on which he served until 2018. Originally delivered as the Gray's Inn Annual Birkenhead Lecture, Sir Christopher will talk about the Nuremberg Trial as an international concept, the application of that concept in practice, and an appraisal of the Nuremberg process. Was it a corrupt case of Victor's justice or a trailblazing development of international law? Master. James, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Yes, 75 years on, the trial actually opened on the 20th of November 1945, so we've just missed the exact 75th anniversary. It was very much a trailblazer in this sense. A trial of 21 of the leading figures of Nazi Germany and the trial in absentia of one other, Martin Bormann, who we now know was already dead, but they weren't sure about that at the time. And the trial was held in the German city of Nuremberg, at scene of the famous um, Nuremberg rallies that Hitler had staged in the 1930s, in front of an international military tribunal of eight judges, two each from France, Russia, the United States and the United Kingdom, with a British judge, uh, Lord Lawrence, as he became, as the president of the trial. Um, the trial was, however, run almost entirely by the Americans. They provided all the court facilities, they provided the ushers, the clerks, the security guards. Uh, it was in their sector of Germany. And as we'll see, America had a very significant influence on the trial process. Lawrence didn't quite go for some of the Americanisms that he was offered. Um, in accordance with normal US court practice, he was provided with a gavel in order to bang that to bring the court to order. Um, he never used it on the first day and somebody stole it uh, as soon as the first day of the trial had ended. But as one observer said, Lawrence was the kind of man who never needed a, a gavel. He could bring a court to order just by the force of his personality. Now, as, as you said, James, the question that I think we need to look at is this. Was Nuremberg a vindication of international justice, of the idea that even in the most terrible of wars, there can be rules of law that govern how people have to behave, and that those rules can be enforced? That's one perspective on Trump. Or was it a case of Victor's justice, or perhaps Victor's revenge, a show trial in which the side that had won the Second World War put on trial the losers, even though in some cases, at least, it was the conduct in which they themselves had engaged. That's the question I want to ask at the end of this talk. But before going there, I think we need to look at the concept behind the trial, how it all came about, at the way in which that concept was applied in practice, and lastly, turn to the appraisal and the influence that the trial has had on the development of international justice in the last 75 years. Now, if we start with the concept, there was nothing new about the idea of law in warfare in 1939 to 45. It was a concept that stretched back hundreds of years, particularly in relation to naval warfare. There were very well established rules about what you could and could not do. And there were courts which enforced those. Land warfare was a bit slower to catch up with that, 
But even so, you do have precedents in the 18th and 19th centuries of people being tried, for example, for the murder of a prisoner of war. And one of the most famous of these trials took place in 1865, when Henry Burtz, the commandant of the Andersonville prisoner of war camp, a Confederate prisoner of war camp in the American Civil War, was put on trial for the deaths of over 10,000 of those in his custody, who died as a result of disease, neglect, and malnutrition. The trial was presided over by a Northern general, Lew Wallace, who may be better known to people as the author of Ben-Hur, um, which later made a Charlton Heston film described by one critic as an unreadable novel turned into an unviewable film. We can come back to that another day. Wurtz was executed, and the trial stands as an example of the implementation of the laws of war, the concept of war crimes, which had actually been codified for the first time during the American Civil War by a German lawyer called Hans Franz Lieber. Lieber had served at the Battle of Waterloo as a 15-year-old boy in the Prussian army, had then gone to America and ended up working as a lawyer in Lincoln's government. And he was asked by Lincoln to produce a code of the laws of war, the famous Lieber Code, which came out in 1863. And after those events, you have the first of the Geneva Conventions on um, wounded and sick, and then gradually the development of other codifications of parts of the laws of war, the concept of war crimes. So there's nothing new about the idea of law there. There's nothing completely new about the idea even of an international trial. Nearly 500 years before the Nuremberg process, Peter von Hagenbach, uh, a Burgundian military commander, was tried by an international tribunal, well, international in the sense that it was made up of the representatives of several different city-states within the Holy Roman Empire. And he was convicted of war crimes and executed, just like Wurtz. There's also nothing particularly new about the idea of controversy being aroused by these sorts of trials. Um, Wurtz, for example, is commemorated today by a monument erected by the state legislature of Georgia in the 1920s to commemorate someone Georgia regarded as a martyr for the Confederate cause. Von Hagenbach doesn't have a monument, but his trial certainly wouldn't meet modern human rights standards. His confession was elicited by torture, and he was very brutally executed when the trial finished. But if we skip ahead a bit to the end of the First World War, you begin to see the contours of what then happened at Nuremberg evolving. In the aftermath of Germany's uh, surrender, the armistice, in November 1918, there was a very powerful group calling for, in the words of the slogan, hang the Kaiser without trial. And it was partly because of that that a group of international lawyers and politicians, particularly the American president, Woodrow Wilson, looked at the question of whether there could be war crimes trials instead of an arbitrary execution. And they appointed a, ninth, a, a commission of international jurists to look into this possibility. The commission reported that there was every reason why somebody could be put on trial for war crimes, that's violations of the laws that govern how a war is to be conducted. And that even the status of a person as head of state or head of government would not make them immune from a criminal process of that kind. And the commission recommended the establishment of an international court to carry out these trials. But it was much less happy about some of the other concepts that were being discussed at the time. Many of the allied leaders wanted not just to try the German military crimes against the, in relation to the conduct of the war. They wanted to try the Kaiser and the military leadership for cr starting the war in the first place. Now the commission wasn't happy about that. Uh, the war was clearly illegal in some respects. There was an undoubted violation of the neutrality of Belgium, which Germany had guaranteed by treaty as well. But it was less than clear that there was a body of law actually dictating when states could resort to force in any circumstances. And so the compromise the Commission came up with was that there should be a, a declaration of the responsibility of the German state for starting the war, 
but no charges against individuals. The Commission's report says this, the Commission is of the opinion that a criminal charge can be made against the responsible authority, sorry, that no criminal charge can be made against the responsible authorities or individuals, notably the ex-Kaiser, on the special head of breaches of neutrality. But it then went on to say the gravity of these gross outrages upon the law of nations and international good faith is such that the Commission thinks they should be the subject of a formal condemnation by the conference. That's the Versailles conference. Well, that didn't please Lloyd George and the, many of the other heads of state and government at Versailles. And the Treaty of Versailles in Article 227 goes much further than the Commission had proposed. The Allied and Associated Powers, it says, publicly arraign William II of Hohenzollern, formerly German Emperor, for a supreme offence against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. You notice that the word law doesn't appear in that, which may perhaps reflect an element of uncertainty created by the Commission's report. Now, what's being discussed here is something very different from crimes against the laws of war. The laws of war govern how you conduct a war. They have nothing to say about the rights and wrongs of starting a war in the first place. Article 227 is therefore breaking quite new ground. And there was other new ground being broken as well, because the laws of war are designed to protect the nationals of one belligerent state from the activities of the rival belligerent. They don't have anything to say about the treatment by a belligerent of its own people. But of course, the First World War had raised a serious question about that with the massacres by the Ottoman government of the Armenians, who were Ottoman citizens. And that's where the term crimes against humanity first gets mentioned, not actually in the 1919 report, but a little bit earlier at the time that the massacres were taking place. Now, nothing came of Article 227. The Kaiser had gone into exile in the Netherlands. The Dutch government refused to extradite him. And he died there not long after Germany occupied the Netherlands in 1940. There were a few trials in Germany itself, but very little came of them, and the sentences passed were very light. There was considerable hostility in Germany to the whole idea of trials. And nothing is done about the idea of creating an international tribunal during the interwar years. It's not until the horrors of the Second World War, and in particular, the horrors of the concentration camps and the Holocaust became known. Only then did states start talking about reviving the ideas discussed at Versailles. And again, the revival was spurred in part by the suggestion of a great many people at the time that you didn't need to have any trials. Guilt was obvious, you just shoot people. Um, at the Yalta conference, um, Stalin proposed that 50,000 leading Germans should be arbitrarily executed. Roosevelt suggested this was not quite acceptable. 49,500 would be quite enough. The fact that Roosevelt later said he was joking in some respect makes me even more unsettled than the original proposal from Stalin. Churchill, interestingly, was very hostile to that arbitrary executions idea, although he certainly flirted with it at other times, as did Anthony Eden. But in the end, a different school of thought prevailed, led in large part by international lawyers in America and the United Kingdom. In the UK in particular, Hirsch Lankaplar, who was the Hill Professor of International Law at Cambridge and the Fellow of Trinity, played a leading role in drafting the charter of what became the Nuremberg Tribunal and in formulating the indictment. Now the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal was it an agreement originally concluded between the four major allied powers, France, Russia, the US and the UK. But then some 20 other allied powers became associated with it. And that's most of the leading allies, countries like the Netherlands, for example. The charter therefore is an international agreement by the winning, between the winning states. But it's a little bit more than that because Germany by this stage had surrendered unconditionally, and therefore the government of Germany was in fact the four leading allied powers. And they, on behalf of Germany, assented to the Charter. So it has a rather odd status. 
Nothing like it has ever been seen since. For those of you who are really interested in comparisons, the Tokyo Tribunal is quite different. That was simply a unilateral act by General MacArthur as the Supreme Allied Commander in charge of the Japanese occupation. It's not an international treaty. And the Nuremberg Charter provided for the trial of three different types of crime. Crimes against peace, which are described as planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances. War crimes, that's the old established body of law, violations of the laws or customs of war. Such violations shall include, but not be limited to, murder, ill treatment, deportation to slave labor, or for any other purpose of civilian population of or in occupied territory. And then it goes on in the same vein. And lastly, crimes against humanity, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts. Now, of course, it was very important indeed to add that crimes against humanity clause. And it's worth just exploring the overlap between crimes against humanity and war crimes just for a moment. It's often thought that crimes against humanity are committed against civilians, and war crimes are committed against the other side's armed forces. And that's not quite right. If you take, for example, the destruction of the Jewish population of territories that Germany would occupy, Poland, for example, that would be a war crime as well as a crime against humanity. But it was Germany's destruction of its own Jewish population and certain other groups within Germany, which can only fall within the concept of crimes against humanity. Like the massacres of the Armenians, they wouldn't have been covered by the laws of war as those laws were understood then and indeed are still understood today. There's also a very important innovation in crimes against the peace, because although this was discussed at Versailles, as we've seen, they never really sorted out then what it was they meant. Whereas by the time you get to the IMT Charter, you get very clear talk about violation, war of aggression, war in violation of international treaties, agreements, assurances. So it's based on the idea that there was already a rule of law that laid down when a state may and may not use force. And that law was already there before 1939, so those who drafted the Charter thought. And secondly, that there was individual criminal responsibility for breaches of the, that law. Now that's very, very interesting because war crimes were the only crimes before then in which individual criminal responsibility had been discussed and accepted as a matter of international law. They, the Charter also provided for an international military tribunal, and it wasn't intended to be confined to the military and political leadership of Germany. The people actually put on trial in the famous Nuremberg trial were all from the top ranks of the German leadership or the top ranks of the Nazi party. But the idea was that that trial would then be followed by a series of others of leading German military, political, industrial figures. Now, as we'll see, the other trials did take place, but not in front of an international tribunal. They took place in front of United States military courts instead. And I'll explain why that happened a little later. But perhaps the most important difference from the discussions at Versailles is that by the time Article 227 of the Treaty of Versailles was negotiated, most people knew that trial wasn't actually going to happen. When the Charter of the International Military Tribunal was written in the summer of 1945, there was not only every likelihood, there was the virtual certainty that these trials would take place. So that's the background, the concept. Let's just fleetingly look at one other aspect, one other debate that went on. Now, I wasn't aware of this until relatively recently, but there was a very important debate between two different ideas about what the trial should be for. Lauterpacht believed that criminal law was about the ill treatment of individuals. But Raphael Lemkin, another famous international lawyer, the man who coined the word genocide, was much more interested in the destruction, the persecution of groups defined by their ethnicity, their religion, or whatever it happened to be. 
Now, the latter part of vision won out in terms of the Nuremberg trial. But Lemkin's influence has also been very powerful in later years, and as we'll see, both strands now find their place in the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction. Let's turn then to the application of these principles by the Nuremberg Tribunal. As I say, there were 22 people indicted, but we can leave Borman out of account because he was already dead. There were four counts, crimes against the peace, and it's a, a sort of additional category of conspiracy to wage aggressive war, the common plan as it was called. That very much reflected the American influence because American common law has probably the broadest idea of conspiracy that you'll find in any country in the world. And it may be because it was a peculiarly American idea that it didn't really work at Nuremberg. Most of those tried for the common plan or conspiracy were acquitted on that charge, even if they were convicted on other counts. And interestingly, nobody was convicted of conspiracy unless they were also convicted of crimes against the peace. Then there were war crimes themselves, and lastly, crimes against humanity. Now of those, the war crimes were in a sense the easy part. The law was fairly easily identified. Most of it was contained in the three Geneva Conventions of 1929, in the Hague Regulations on Land Warfare of 1907, and the Customary International Law, and it was fairly well written up by the time you get to the start of the Second World War. There was also ample evidence, for example, of the murder of prisoners of war, of reprisal killings in occupied territory, and violations of that kind. Crimes against humanity were more difficult because the idea had never really been tested out before. For all the talk about crimes against humanity in the context of the slaughter of the Armenians in 1915, nobody really thought, had thought it through as a legal concept until we get to the Second World War. Incidentally, many of the trials that have taken place relating to the Second World War in more recent years have been for crimes against humanity. But that's often because there is a statute of limitations in many countries on war crimes. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, who was uh, caught by the French in 1988 and put on trial, was tried for crimes against humanity though he could just as well have been tried for war crimes. It was simply that the statute of limitations precluded it. Now, the Nuremberg Tribunal was distinctly uneasy about the concept of crimes against humanity. The notion that there could be individual criminal responsibility of the high officials of a state for the way they treated their own people was a concept which didn't go down particularly well, certainly with the two Soviet judges. And in the end, the tribunal took a very restrictive view of what crimes against humanity meant. To constitute a crime against humanity, the acts relied on before, before the outbreak of war must have been in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. In other words, what had happened in the earlier phases of the Holocaust could be the subject of the jurisdiction of the tribunal only if it could be linked to war crimes or later crimes against humanity. As the tribunal put it, revolting and horrible as many of these crimes were, it has not been satisfactorily proved that they were done in execution of or in connection with any such crimes as crimes within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. So effectively, the way in which they interpreted crimes against humanity in 1945-46 meant that nothing that had happened before the Second World War started in the way of the ill treatment of part of the German population or the Austrian Jewish population was going to be taken into account. Pre-1939 acts, a take or pre-September 1939 acts, were taken into account only in relation to the common plan or conspiracy charge or where they could be specifically linked to something that happened after the outbreak of war. Now, ironically, even that was too broad for some commentators, but it was also much too narrow for others. And as we'll see, the law after 1945 developed slightly differently. And then we have the concept of crimes against the peace and the common plan. Now, as we've seen, there's a clear subordination of the conspiracy charge, the common plan charge, 
but crimes against the peace remained extremely significant. Though it's interesting that only Hess, Rudolf Hess, who fled to Britain in 1941, was convicted of aggression, crimes against the peace, but not convicted of either war crimes or crimes against humanity. There are also one or two parts of the Nuremberg decision here, which are a little difficult to take, frankly. Um, Dönitz, Admiral Dönitz, was tried in part for crimes against the peace and convicted on the basis that when he became Hitler's successor after Hitler committed suicide, Dönitz was in charge of the German Reich for about two weeks before he signed the instrument of surrender. Dönitz kept on fighting and therefore was guilty of a crime of aggression. Now, I, I've never found that satisfactory, I have to say. Dönitz and the German forces kept fighting largely to try and prevent more of the territory and more of the German people ending up under Soviet control. And they, content, they continued fighting to enable people to flee to the West. Now, whether you could bring that within the idea of a crime against the peace is frankly very difficult. Let me turn then to the aftermath. Well, the Nuremberg trial ground on for just under a year, which is actually quite quick by the standards of today. The International Criminal Court regularly takes three or four. But at the time, a year's trial was considered a very long process indeed. And during that year, the relationship between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union largely broke down. So there was no enthusiasm at the end of the trial for the successor trials to be held of the German High Command and other groups. Instead, what happened was that the United States offered to provide its own system of military courts sitting in the same courtroom in Nuremberg, and they would try these other groups. And there are about 10 of these Control Council Law Number 10 trials, as they're known. In many respects, much more interesting than the main Nuremberg trial. The trial of German industrialists and leading civil servants, uh, the trial of uh, the German High Command, of the German commanders in the Balkans, for example. And all of these had a probably a rather greater influence in shaping the law and warfare in the years after World War II. There were also literally thousands of trials held by national courts. Um, some of them, frankly, a little better than licensed lynchings. But many of them were held in accordance with due process and they were scrupulously reported in various series of war crimes reports. And they're often not very interesting to the lawyer because there isn't a reasoned judgment, it's just a verdict of guilty or not guilty. There are also at times um, that the standards fall well short of anything we'd regard as due process today. Take just one example, um, the Pelias trial. A German U-boat commander and two of his officers were tried for the war crime of shooting down, machine gunning, the survivors of a Greek merchant ship um, after the merchant ship had been torpedoed and the crew had managed to get into lifeboats or was swimming, holding onto bits of driftwood or rafts. The U-boat sailed up and down machine gunning. Now, there's little doubt that Lieutenant Commander Eck and his two colleagues were guilty. What had happened was fairly well known. They didn't really contest the basic fact. But there's something very unappetizing to me as a lawyer in the fact that the conviction was based on written statements from witnesses who weren't called at the trial to testify and be cross-examined because they were at the other side of Europe and it was too expensive to bring them over. Also, the fact that defence counsel were only appointed a couple of days before the trial started and that the only copy of the textbook on the laws of war in the courtroom belonged to the prosecuting counsel who generously passed it over to defence counsel when he'd finished his own speech. So Lieutenant Commander Eck and his two colleagues, both of all of whom were executed, probably did deserve their conviction and leave the sentence to others to think about. But nevertheless, the trial leaves a bad taste in the mouth. And that's true of quite a number of the other post-war war crimes trials. Now, what about the influence of Nuremberg in the aftermath? Well, for 40 years, it had almost no influence at all. Um, I studied international law at Cambridge in the 1970s. Nobody paid any attention to Nuremberg at all. There was no suggestion that there might one day be an international criminal court. And had you made such a suggestion, frankly, you would have been laughed at. 
it was considered completely out of the question. Everything changed though in 1993 with the fighting that was going on in the former Yugoslavia, particularly in Bosnia. A number of states, powerful on the Security Council, wanted to do something about the Yugoslav conflict, but there was no agreement about sending troops to Yugoslavia in anything other than a peacekeeping role. So in 1993, the UN Security Council created an international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia to sit in The Hague and to have jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, but not crimes against the peace committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since the state had started to break up in 1991. Now, I have to confess, I thought at the time that the Yugoslav tribunal would be a failure. In fact, it was extremely successful in two respects. Every defendant that it charged ended up in custody. Some of them died before the trial was completed, including Slobodan Milosevic, um, the leader of uh, Serbia. But most of the trials were completed. Some resulted in convictions, some not. Some of the convictions were overturned on appeal. And the second reason why it's quite successful is that the common refrain I hear from everybody in the former Yugoslavia is that the Yugoslav tribunal was biased against their particular group. Um, that's about as good a testimony to its impartiality as you're likely to get. It was followed by the Rwanda tribunal that was set up in 1994, uh, again by the UN Security Council, and finally by the creation of the International Criminal Court, a permanent international court. Uh, which was created in 1998 and came into being in 2002. The jurisdiction of that tribunal, that court rather, does include uh, the crime of aggression or crimes against the peace, although it, that was only added to its jurisdiction at a later stage, and it's hedged around with considerable uh, qualifications. The, the court can only prosecute somebody for a crime of aggression if the Security Council has first made a finding that the state which that individual served was guilty of aggression. So far, that has never happened. That the Security Council has never made a finding of aggression in its entire history. Now, there's no doubt that the Nuremberg legacy was important in the ICTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the International Criminal Court, and in various others, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, some uh, courts set up to try Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge for atrocities in Cambodia. Important, but not decisive. There was a general rejection of the limit on crimes against humanity that was uh, a feature of the Nuremberg Tribunal. There was also a rejection of the idea of death sentences. The Security Council decided right from the start that nobody was going to be sentenced to death in a court that it created and the states that set up the ICC took the same view. That leads to some rather strange consequences. In Rwanda, for example, only the leaders of the genocide in Rwanda were put on trial in front of the Rwanda Tribunal, where the highest sentence that could be passed was life imprisonment. But the people lower down the chain of command could be tried in Rwandan courts where the death sentence was still possible. But in fact, very few death sentences were actually passed and even fewer were carried out. So what then is our verdict on the Nuremberg trial? Was it vindication or was it victor's justice? Those who criticise the Nuremberg process tend to pick on three features of what happened. First of all, the argument of hypocrisy that the Allies tried the Germans for doing things they had done themselves. Secondly, a legal principle known in Latin, and no lawyer can give a lecture without quoting Latin at some point, nullum poena sine lege, you cannot have a crime without a law. The critics of Nuremberg argue there was no law in 1939 to 45 that prohibited the conduct in question. That law was invented by the Nuremberg Tribunal or by the Allies in setting up the charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal. And thirdly, the argument that there was 
no due process, that the trial didn't meet fairness requirements, the verdict was a foregone conclusion. And in, I'd like to look briefly at each of those three criticisms. Take the hypocrisy one first. Now there's one instance at Nuremberg that definitely rings that particular bell. The charges against Admiral Dönitz, who had commanded the German U-boat fleet before eventually taking over from Hitler after Hitler's suicide. The charges against Dönitz included a charge of illegally waging unrestricted submarine warfare, a sink on site policy. Now that certainly was illegal. There was no difficulty in establishing that by reference to the treaties concluded between the two world wars and indeed the law as it stood before World War I. The problem was that one of the witnesses who testified in favor of Admiral Dönitz was the American Admiral Nimitz who commanded the US Navy in the Pacific Theater of War who said that unrestricted submarine warfare was employed by the Americans and their allies in the Pacific from the very start of fighting there in December 1941. And that posed a dilemma for the tribunal. What do you do if the defendant's conduct has in fact been committed by the other side as well? And in the end, the tribunal took a, the approach of fudging that question. They convicted Dermitz, and they said that the fact the Americans had done the same did not amount to a defense. But they then said they weren't going to add anything to his sentence on account of that conviction. So the conviction of unrestricted submarine warfare stat stood, but without any sentence being passed. And in fact, Dönitz got one of the lighter sentences passed at Nuremberg. He was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Although unlike most of the others who went to prison, he served the entire length of his sentence. So in Dönitz's case, yes, you can make an argument about hypocrisy. But I think there are many other areas where you can't. There's nothing in the Allied history that resembles the concentration camps, the Holocaust, the use of slave labor, the reprisal killings in occupied territory, the burning of towns in occupied territory. There's nothing like that on the other side in the conflict at all. Yes, when you come to something like bombing of cities, but not when you come to those crimes against people who are helpless and completely in your power. There's no evidence of the murder of prisoners of war, for example, in the way that there was systematic murder of prisoners of war in some parts of the European theater. So I don't find the charge of hypocrisy terribly persuasive. Yes, you can chip away at bits of Nuremberg from that ground, but I don't think you can undermine the entire Nuremberg process or even the main part of the Nuremberg process. Then what about the argument that you cannot have a crime without a law? There could be no retrospective justice. You've got to, the prosecution has got to show that the conduct was illegal at the time that the act took place. It can't be made illegal later. Well, I think that argument plainly doesn't work in relation to war crimes. The law there was well established and indeed had been written up in manuals for the German armed forces just as much as for the British or the Americans. Yes, they took different views at times about what the law meant. But interestingly, the German army had a war crimes bureau that investigated allegations of war crimes against the Russian forces in particular, but also against the British and the Americans and French. So I think the argument that there was no law on war crimes before Nuremberg is quite simply nonsense. When you come to crimes against humanity and crimes against the peace though, the picture is less clear. With crimes against the peace, I think had there been a charge in 1919 against the Kaiser, it would have been a clear case of retrospective law. Since 1919, there had been a number of developments, particularly the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, which outlawed war as an instrument of national policy added to which you had a number of treaties on neutrality that I think were quite clearly broken. So the argument that Germany had violated international law by means of aggression is an argument that will stand up quite well. 
But what had not been clearly identified before 1939 was that individuals bore criminal responsibility for that. In English law, the fact that something is illegal doesn't mean to say you commit a crime if you do it. There has to be a specific provision for criminal responsibility for the act. It's not enough that the act itself is unlawful. The penalty may be a purely civil one. Does that same principle apply in international law? Let me come back to that in a minute when we've looked at crimes against humanity. Again, with crimes against humanity, nobody had ever been prosecuted for that before 1945. Yes, there had been some talk at Versailles and at the time of a report into the killings of the Armenians in World War I. But there had never been any clear identification either of the law itself or of the concept of individual criminal responsibility. So on the face of it, the charge of retrospective legislation here is really quite a powerful one, not in war crimes, but in relation to the other two counts. But I don't in the end find it completely persuasive for this reason. The purpose of the rule that says you mustn't have retrospective criminal legislation is that people should know where they stand at the time that they act, that nobody should be penalized afterwards for doing something which they and everybody else thought was perfectly legitimate at the time it took place. But you only have to look at the conduct and the evidence at Nuremberg to see that nobody could have been in any doubt that the slaughter in the concentration camps, for example, or that the unprovoked invasion of countries like Belgium and the Netherlands was conduct that was not legitimate by any standard. And so although as a lawyer, I'm slightly uneasy about the way it was done, the basic moral principle there, I think ends up coming down in favor of the Nuremberg process rather than against it. Lastly, there's the question of what about due process? Well, we all have different ideas of what due process entails. And having sat as a judge, albeit only doing civil cases for nine years, in a court with judges from all around the world, I can tell you that the idea of what is proper evidence, what is convincing, what procedure should be followed, can give rise to endless arguments. But I think if you look at the Nuremberg trial, the basic elements of due process are there. The charges were clearly stated, the defendants were given time to prepare their defence. In the case of Goering, at least, he made very good use of that time. He was devastated on occasions at the trial and indeed made a complete fool of Robert Jackson, the lead US prosecutor, who was a Supreme Court judge who'd taken leave in order to go and do the prosecution. He was only tripped up by the junior British counsel, Mervyn Griffith Jones, who later prosecuted Penguin Books in the Lady Chatterley's Lover case. Mervyn Griffith Jones did succeed in undermining Goering's defenses. I think if you look at the trial as a whole, the due process requirements, the notion that it should be a fair trial was there. But there's one thing that might give you pause. The second British judge, Lord Justice Burkett, kept a diary. That diary shows that the, the court started drafting the judgment before the case had finished. Now that might be perfectly all right. It may be that it was worth getting on with the bits that have already been concluded, rather than waiting until the whole trial was over. But again, it leaves a slight feel of uneasiness about the way in which the procedure was conducted by the court. On the whole, I think it meets the standard of fairness, but perhaps with one or two difficulties. What happened to the defendants? Well, leaving out Bourne, of the 21 who were still alive, um, three of them were acquitted completely. 12 were sentenced to death, and all the death sentences were carried out. The others received, life, uh, received sentences ranging from life in the case of Rudolf Hess down to 10 years in the case of Admiral Gurnitz. Now, of those, there are one or two that one might perhaps question. Julius Stryker was a particularly difficult case. Stryker was by any standards a particularly obnoxious Nazi. In fact, he was so obnoxious that the other defendants couldn't stand him at any price and didn't want to have anything to do with him. 
but he was also somebody with no military or leadership ability whatsoever. His contribution and the basis for his trial and conviction of crimes against humanity was the vitriol of anti-Semitic propaganda that he published. And it was absolute appalling vitriol. And I think you can justify his conviction on the basis that it, he played a leading role in stirring up anti-Semitic feeling and feeding the idea that Jews were not really human beings and that therefore what was being done to them wasn't wrong. But it was words only. And it's worth comparing that with Radio Neil Colleen in the Rwanda trial. Radio Rwanda trial, rather. Radio Neil Colleen is a radio station in Rwanda which broadcasts very vitriolic anti Tutsi propaganda. But it also gave details of where Tutsi refugees were hiding, where women and children could be found, and how they should be treated when found. So it went rather further in practical terms than Stryker did. Of the acquittals, three of them, uh, the, the three people who were acquitted, von Papen, uh, Schacht and Fritsch, uh, all of them were tried by German courts. And indeed, there were slogans painted up on the walls outside the INT building in Nuremberg, calling for the death sentence to all three of them. It's a striking contrast with the end of World War I, where there was a great reluctance to put Germans on trial in Germany. Two of those convictions were later overturned on appeal. Of the death sentences, all of them were carried out, although Goering succeeded in killing himself um, by taking a poison capsule shortly before he was hanged. One last lesson that we draw from Nuremberg is this. Of the prisoners who weren't executed, who spent their time in jail, the last one to die was Rudolf Hess. He lingered on in Spandau prison in Germany under a regime under which the guards were provided in equal numbers by Russia, France, the United States and the United Kingdom. The four countries took it in turns a month at a time to actually provide the guards. And any decision had to be taken by a unanimous decision of the four governors, one from each state. Of course, by the time you get into the Cold War period, they couldn't agree on anything, so no decisions at all got taken. One particularly um, sad element of that was that the Russians vetoed a proposal that Hess should be allowed to watch the 1966 England-Germany World Cup football final. The Russian governor said that if Hess watched this and saw Germany win, it would arouse nationalist feelings in his breast. It was not only rather inhuman, but also showed a total lack of understanding of football because of course England won the World Cup final in 1966 and it would probably have done Hess a great deal of good to see his country beaten. But one thing that came out of the Spandau episode is that by the time the Yugoslav Tribunal was set up in 1993 and then the International Criminal Court a few years later, there was absolute agreement that no one was going to have another Spandau international prison. The Dutch authorities provided a prison to keep people in while they were awaiting trial and undergoing trial. It was only a few hundred yards away from where I lived when I was in The Hague. Um, Slobodan Milosevic, incidentally, was the top of the tennis table, uh, table tennis league table in um, the jail there in Shreden. But sentences would have to be served somewhere else. Sentences would be served in prisons provided by states that volunteered their services. That gave rise to an interesting question about whether you should get a longer prison term if you went to a country with a lenient prison regime, rather than if you went to one of the countries that had a rather stricter one. But that legacy has lingered on. As, even as we have this meeting today, there is in a prison in County Durham, a man called Charles Taylor. He's a former president of Liberia who's serving a sentence of 50 years imposed by the Special Court for Sierra Leone, one of the tribunals set up by the United Nations. He was convicted of just about every variant on crimes against humanity and war crimes that you could imagine. He's serving that sentence in a British jail because this was Britain's contribution to looking after international defendants after their conviction. And perhaps a bit of a payback for what happened at Spandau.
Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Master. On behalf of a, a very large audience, an audience, alas, that you couldn't see, for that um, deeply and at times, I think, uncomfortably fascinating lecture. A lecture about a trial um, that was about, I think, so much more than establishing guilt or innocence, but about creating and preserving a historical record. A trial, as you've explained, um, about pragmatism at times, as much as principles or principle or principles, in fact, often in conflict with each other. So many issues that you've pursued about victor's justice or not, and that as you closed with those remarks, that also have so many contemporary resonances in all too many parts of the world where crimes against humanity continue, but also where peace and justice are often uncomfortable companions. So thank you so much. We're all hugely grateful to you. Thank you.